Hello and welcome to this mini course. My name is Rebecca Esterson. I'm on the faculty of our denomination seminary, which is sometimes known as the New Church Theological School and sometimes known as the Center for Swedenborgian Studies at the Graduate Theological Union. I'm so uh, grateful to be here with you, sort of, uh, at convention. I deeply regret not being able to come to Boston this year. My family and I lived in um, the area for a long time, and I m missed the opportunity to see all my people in Cambridge and Boston. Um, in fact, if you look over my shoulder here, you'll see my signature wheel, which was given to us by the congregation in Cambridge. So you're with me here in my office whenever I'm here. Um, uh, it's lovely to have your presence in my office space here, but I do miss that I'm not able to be on the East Coast this summer for convention. Of course, convention's been organized virtually uh, because of the unusual circumstances. So we meet this way. Uh, the format here, um, as you probably know, is that this will be a half hour recorded video um, and then we will have a live Q&A afterwards. So I'm here in my office in Berkeley recording ahead of time the lecture portion of the mini course. So here we go. Our topic for today is, uh, the title of our mini course is The Harmonic One, Suggestions of Divine Plurality in the Bible and in Swedenborg. So it's a provocative idea here that we'll be exploring. Um, what I'm not doing today, what I don't have intentions of doing is um, telling you what God is like. I'm not interested or qualified uh, to do that. I'm not um, going to be producing any kind of doctrine or dogma or suggestion of theological certainty. In fact, um, quite the opposite. I'm hoping to open up some ideas from our texts and our tradition uh, around the oneness of God and, and look at these ideas and ponder them and ask questions and maybe provide some tools for um, thinking about this. And my, my, my real agenda here is to reflect on the implications of our beliefs about what God is like. Um, the very beginning uh, numbers, the opening numbers of the book Divine Love and Wisdom, Swedenborg suggests that our idea of God, how we conceive of God, uh, has very serious implications and consequences. It affects us at a very deep level, and it affects our interpersonal relationships. In fact, Swedenborg even suggests that it has consequences to eternity. So this is a sort of major butterfly effect here. So how we think about the divine uh, has consequences and has implications beyond a theoretical, theological framework. So in that, uh, in that kind of line of thinking, I want to open with a video about this topic. And it's a video that comes out of Stanford University related to a study that has just been published this year on this very thing. What are the consequences of how we think about what God is like? Uh, and in this study, the, um, the results indicate that how we think about God, what God is like, what God looks like in particular, affects who we think makes a good leader, who we think makes a good boss. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and play this just two minute video. So here's the video and I'm just going to press play. The image of God as a white man is very pervasive in our society. We found that the stronger a person's belief, the more convinced they were that God was a white man, the more likely they were to perceive white men as worthy of leadership positions and the less likely they were to see black people and women as worthy of those positions. 
I grew up in a almost exclusively black church led by a, a black female minister. And within that church, there was imagery of a white male God that just always stood out to me, an entity that didn't necessarily look like anyone in the church. And I always wondered how that affected us psychologically. We recruited children from Sunday schools across different churches in the Bay Area and a few in North Carolina. We gave them a, a pack of 14 crayons with different skin tones and colors and asked them to just draw a picture of, of God. However, whatever you think God looks like, just draw a picture of God. And then we also gave them the same categorization task that we gave adults, where we would show them pairs of faces and out of those two we would ask them, who do you think looks more than God? After all that was said and done, we showed them 12 faces and told them, hey, there are lots of people at the place where I work, but only three people are bosses. Can you tell me which one of these people are bosses? The extent to which the children drew God as white on those drawings predicted how many white people they chose as bosses. In one aspect of the study, we just typed God into Google Images to see how often is God portrayed as a white male. And we found that I think it was about 72% of all the images that came up that presented God in some kind of humanized form did in fact present God as a, a white male. And I think 6% of the images presented God as Morgan Freeman from the film Bruce Almighty. We live in a society in which there's a lot of racism and sexism across many domains of American life. And I think our studies really importantly capture how that racism and sexism even influences spaces like the U.S. church. The findings I hope may spark a critical conversation about how to maybe work toward a church in a broader society where anybody can be perceived as worthy of leadership irrespective of their race or gender. Okay, so very interesting study. Uh, it's caused some reflection on my part. I, when I was growing up, when I was a kid, I had teachers and ministers who would tell me it's very important to have an idea, an image in your mind of what God looks like. And it's even important to draw God, um, like the students, in, uh, the, the kids in that study, or to have a picture of God somewhere up in your room or your house so that you could Imagine God in a way that you could have a personal relationship and uh, communicate with God in a personal way. So I grew up with that idea and it always seemed um, important somehow to have an image of God in my head. And yet I have grown to see the potential uh, pitfalls or obstacles in doing that. It, it then limits your idea of who God is or who might be godly or who might look more in the image of God here on earth um, in ways that that study suggests. So I want to, I want to again, think with you, think with our tradition, and in particular, think with our texts today. My my uh, job here in our seminary is to teach classes on our texts and the interpretation of texts uh, of scripture. And my approach generally is to think of scripture, to think of our sacred texts as like a collection of jewels, a collection of crystals or gems that can be held up to the light. We can take a concept or even a single word from scripture and we can hold it up to the light and see how the light is refracted and re reflected and see new colors, new patterns that we hadn't seen before. Our texts can also be used as weapons. We can weaponize our texts and use them against each other, use them in ways that promote hate and violence. We can do both things with our texts. So uh, we have to be careful. But this is what I want to do today. I want to hold up a few key terms and uh, some texts with you and hold them up to the light and see if they're useful to us. See if we can see anything, any patterns or colors that are interesting, new, helpful in some way. So I want to begin with our study of this idea of God's oneness. 
the oneness of God is so fundamental to our Swedenborgian faith. In fact, we sometimes use it to distinguish ourselves from a Trinitarian perspective or a polytheistic perspective, that we really focus and emphasize the oneness of God. So I want to open that up and think about what that means, uh, because there's a lot in there and there's some very interesting things in our texts. So let's begin this study by looking at the names of God that we find in particular in the Hebrew Bible, in the Old Testament parts of scripture. Um, in English translations, when we read the Bible in English, we tend to see one of two words for God. We see God and we see Lord. Those translations are, they're translations for many more words in Hebrew. For God, though. So there are many more terms and words in the Hebrew original texts of the Bible than just two. We, have, we see two in English, but in Hebrew, there's lots more. So I'm going to share my screen again. So here in the middle column of this slide, you can see some of the names in Hebrew. It's transliterated into English uh, uh, alphabet here. But you see some of these are not all of the terms in Hebrew that we have for God, but these are some of them. And I have written on the right side how it is translated. So we have this word El in the Bible. And sometimes it comes with an epithet. Um, El Olam, El Elyon, but uh, El itself is a word for God. And we, we know that this word comes from pre-Israelite words for God. El, in fact, was a Canaanite god who was the creator god or the sky god, uh, who was kind of the head of the pantheon. So similar to Zeus in the Greek pantheon, El is the, the, the highest god in the Canaanite, the very, very, very ancient Near Eastern conception of God. They had this word El, and it shows up in the Bible as a word for God. And it's translated simply as God. And uh, I have the second term here, El Shaddai, is this word El with uh, an, an added term, Shaddai, which we don't actually know for sure what it means. I'll talk more about this term in a minute. But it's typically translated as God Almighty. Then third here, I have the term Elohim, which is a a related word, you have the word El again, but this word is complicated because it shows up in a plural form. So Elohim literally translated would be God's with an S, plural. The I am at the end, the im sound in Hebrew is the plural ending. So it's the same as an English S. You add the im on the end to mean there's more than one. So this is a very surprising grammatical phenomenon in the Bible to have this word gods everywhere in the Hebrew Bible, plural, but it's translated in English as God. Again, I will talk about this term more in a moment. We also find the word Adonai, which simply means my Lord, and it's translated as Lord. And it is also in the plural, which is an interesting thing to note. And then finally, we have the personal name of God. In the Hebrew Bible, in the Old Testament, God is given a personal name, like my personal name is Rebecca. Well, at a certain point in the Bible, God's personal name is revealed. And it is this four-letter Y-H-W-H, yud heh vav heh uh, this mystical word that nobody really knows how to pronounce. Sometimes it's pronounced as Jehovah. That's the pronunciation that Swedenborg uses. Sometimes it's pronounced as Yahweh, which is a 19th century German scholarly pronunciation. So if you hear Jehovah or Yahweh, that's a particular interpretation of this very sacred four letter name of God. In some traditions, it's considered so holy that you shouldn't even pronounce it out loud because 
it's so holy that we, we use other terms for it, like my Lord or the name. And I'll just call it the name for the sake of this presentation. But it's translated into English typically as Lord, all, all caps, all uppercase, L-O-R-D. So if you see that, uh, that's your sign that this is the so-called tetragrammaton, the four-letter name of God. Occasionally it's translated as God, all caps, and that's when it appears side by side with the name Adonai. So rather than translating it as Lord, Lord, it's translated as Lord God with God in caps. So that all capitalized Lord or God is your cue that this is the holy name of God that's being uh, translated this way. Okay, so a little bit more about particularly, we could say a lot about the name, the holy name of God, um, but that's not where I want to focus for today. I want to focus on these two names, El Shaddai and Elohim. So first we'll go to El Shaddai. This is going to transition for me. There we go. Okay. El Shaddai. So again, we don't really know what the word Shaddai means. It's not something we can easily point to. There are lots of theories about what this name means. Uh, let me move my image here so you can see this. Uh, some people say it means mighty or powerful, or it might mean the god of the mountains. There's actually some evidence that it might refer to breasts, that this is the god of breasts or the god with breasts, and that it's, it's um, suggestive of a divine feminine, a motherly maternal form of God. Uh, and I can share a link with anybody who's interested in that particular theory um, to an article on that, that idea. But what we do know is the Bible suggests that this term Shaddai is a word for God that the biblical patriarchs used before they had the holy name. So Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Rebecca, Sarah, Leah, Rachel, the patriarchs and matriarchs would have used this name, Shaddai or El Shaddai, prior to their being given the holy name of God. So it is suggestive of, a, of an ancient term predating Israelite religion, predating this covenant relationship with God. So it, it tends to be associated with uh, religious pluralism, in a sense, God showing up in uh, a, a, an earlier form. And Swedenborg interprets it in this light and says some, some very interesting things about this term for God. So I'll read you one number from Swedenborg's Secrets of Heaven, number 1992, paragraph 4. The reason the Lord was willing to be represented before them, first of all, through the name Shaddai, is that the Lord is never willing to destroy quickly, still less immediately, the worship implanted in someone since earliest childhood. He's unwilling to destroy it because it would be an uprooting, and so a destroying of the deeply implanted feeling for what is holy, which is expressed in adoration and worship a feeling which the Lord never crushes, but bends. The holiness which is expressed in worship and has been inrooted since earliest childhood, it's such that it does not respond to violence, but to gentle and kindly bending. So Swedenborg is lifting up this name as a way of pointing to the way God uh, shows up in the shape of the vessel that has been prepared, in the shape of our particular context, our particular moment and history and place in space. God shows up there in the way that we are ready and willing to receive the divine. Um, so this term El Shaddai is in some ways, again, a way into a pluralistic understanding of religion that religion is uh, building a, a shape of a vessel, building a particular kind of vessel to receive God. Without that vessel, there is no receiving. There is no receiving of influx unless we prepare a vessel. But God will come into the shape of the vessel that we prepare. So I think this is a, um, an interesting idea for us to think about. 
But what about this word Elohim? This plural word for God that is in many places in the Hebrew Bible. It's in the very first verse of Genesis. Vereshit bara Elohim. God created heaven and earth, but it's God in the plural. What do we do with this? Um, there are many theories for this plural form of the name. And you might hear one person suggest one answer as though it's fact, and then another person suggest another answer as though it's fact. Uh, but I'll go through a couple of the theories that are out there. Um, but it typically takes the singular verb. So gods in the plural, but the verb that comes with it is singular, which does have a kind of more comfortable grammar of God in the singular. But there are exceptions to that, particularly in Genesis. And you might f have, be familiar with the verse, let us create humans, Adam, let us create humans in our image. This is a verse from Genesis 1 in which the grammar, every bit of the grammar, the pronouns and the verbs in the sentence is plural. And so scholars and theologians and clergy and rabbis since ancient times have debated the meaning of this plural grammar. Who are the Elohim? Who is Elohim? So the historical critical scholar of the Bible would say, well, Elohim is plural because it comes from this ancient Canaanite context in which all of the forces of nature were considered to be divinities. And so the Elohim taken as a whole represents all of the forces of nature combined. So the Elohim, Elohim is all of the divine forces in a singular form. And here we have an image on the right somewhat pixelated image of the god El, the Canaanite god El that we talked about before. So Elohim is El presiding over all of the divinities, all of the forces of nature. So that's one theory. Um, rabbinic texts from very early times have seen this plural language, particularly in Genesis, as evidence of God talking with the angels talking with the divine court in heaven, in particular, discussing the creation of humans. The implication being that angels were created before human beings, and God is therefore in conversation with the angels. You know, we, let us create human beings in our image, in the image of angels. Uh, very interestingly, Christians beginning uh, sometime in the second century, with Justin Martyr, this early Christian martyr, uh, who uh, put himself in debate with the Jews around him and said, no, 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 you've got it wrong. Elohim isn't God talking to the angels. It's evidence of, in fact, there being a second divine presence there, namely Logos, which he identifies with Christ. So you have God and Logos, let us create man in our image. And ever since the second century, ever since Justin Martyr suggested this in debate with the rabbinic authorities around him, Christians have tended to see this plural grammar, this plural language as evidence that the Trinity was present at the time of creation. And so I have here at the top an image from the ceiling of a monastery where you see the Father, and the Son and the Holy Spirit at the present, present at the time of creation. And that you will hear a lot of Christians today still give this explanation for this plural language. So I think it's interesting um, to read Swedenborg on this. Swedenborg is fascinated with this term Elohim. And in a number of places will discuss the theological implications of the plural grammar. And he says different things about it in different places, uh, but they're all interesting. And I can give you a couple of different numbers, but let's just look at one in particular to start with. Okay, so what do we do with this word Elohim? So this is Sweden, one of Swedenborg's ideas about this, with suggestions. So Secrets of Heaven 9160. 
In the original language, God is indeed called El, which is singular, but more often Elohim, which is plural. And the reason for this is that among the angels in heaven, the divine truth emanating from the Lord is divided into a multitude of different forms. For as many as the angels are, so many are the recipients of God's truth, each one receiving it in their own way. And I have the word Elohim here on the right in the Hebrew, so you can see that form. Um, this is somewhat in line with the earlier um, number that we read from Swedenborg on Shaddai. There's a suggestion that God appears in different forms to different people. In fact, God appears as many ways as there are people. Um, of course, the difference here between Swedenborg's angels and the angels of the rabbis is that for Swedenborg, angels are humans. They're people that weren't pre, pre-existent uh, before human beings. Um, but it is interesting that on the kind of, if there's a Christian Jewish debate here happening, is Elohim indicative, indicative of angels or of the Trinity? Swedenborg is kind of coming down on the side of angels uh, with this humanizing uh, ang- angle on who the angels are. But again, we have an image of God accommodating different contexts, different locations, different temperaments. God shows up the way you need God to show up. Uh, and therefore, we have this plural language in order to communicate this idea to us. Um, and I have some more numbers written here if you want to do some more research on this. Secrets of Heaven 300 is a very interesting text because the suggestion is that in this number, I don't have it written out, but the suggestion there is that actually Elohim implies that the angels are there. P- part of what God's doing involves the angels. The suggestion being that the way we receive God is not just accommodating to our own context, but it's coming through the heavens to us. It's coming through the angelic communities to us. And therefore it's coming in a way that um, carries the multiplicity of the heavens and the multiplicity of angelic bodies. Sometimes Swedenborgians will replace the word heaven in the Lord's Prayer with heavens in the plural to get at this idea that heaven is a place with infinite variety. And therefore, if the influx of God comes through the heavens, it's going to carry the stamp of that variety. So there's some suggestion there that angels actually maybe are included in this word Elohim. Okay, so I want to go back to uh, where we started, which was the the opening numbers of Divine Love and Wisdom, this book, Divine Love and Wisdom, and this idea that how we imagine God has consequences and implications. Um, Check my time here. Okay, we've got to move along. So along with this, Swedenborg presents two ideas. One is that God is infinite, and the other is that God is one. So I want to think about, in particular, this idea, what does it mean that God is infinite? Well, Swedenborg talks elsewhere about the harmonic one, which is the title of this mini-course, and his, um, oh, here we go, this diary. Okay, let's start with this quote from, uh, from the spiritual diary, number 2016, where Swedenborg suggests, Every one is formed from the harmony of many, and the one is such as the harmony is, nor can there ever be an absolute one, but only a harmonic one. Now, it's interesting, in some translations, you'll find everyone is formed from the harmony of many. They put that into a single word, everyone, but that's not what it says in the Latin. It says every unum, every unit, every single is formed from the harmony of many. And I wonder if the translator was a little nervous about the implications of this idea and put in their own uh, little twist. But what are the implications? And, I, and I'm not sure they're that radical. Um, if we go back and look at Divine Love and Wisdom, where Swedenborg talks about 
God being distinguishably one. God being distinguishably one. How can you be distinguishably one? What does that mean? Well, there's a suggestion that there are, um, in essence, there are kind of two parts of God. There's divine love and divine wisdom. Or there's God's essay, God's essence, and God's existere, the way God manifests, kind of a, a holy core and a manifestation. Another way of looking at it is that God has a soul and a body, the way that we have a soul and a body. And that, so we can, we can distinguish parts. We can distinguish two halves in some ways to the divine whole. So God is distinguishably one in that there are these distinguishable parts. And Swedenborg does actually say, look at these two words, Elohim and the Tetragrammaton, the holy name of God, these correspond to these distinguishable parts of God. These two names, these two names in the Bible are suggestive of God's um, nature in this regard. Uh, Swedenborg also says, okay, you need to, new ways of thinking about this. In God, there are infinite things, not just two. It's not just a binary of divine love and divine wisdom, soul and body. Actually, there are infinite things in God. And Swedenborg says, think of a body. The way our bodies have infinite parts. Similarly, God's body has infinite parts. Or think of it like the universe, Swedenborg suggests. We can look at biodiversity. We can look at the plants and animals around us. We can look at the diversity within human life even. And we can see uh, how creation is so beautiful because of its diversity. And that's the quality of the divine. The divine shares that same kind of quality that the infinite, infiniteness, the infinite parts that make up God constitute God's holiness and God's beauty. And again, uh, like heaven, Swedenborg point, points to the diversity of heaven itself as reflecting this aspect of the divine. Okay, so we're out of time. So I will just end with a couple of discussion questions and hope that we can go into this a little bit deeper uh, together. And of course, I'm happy to continue the conversation after this session. There's a lot more to say about these ideas and these texts and these terms. We've only been able to touch on them briefly, but here I'll end with some discussion questions. Okay, here they are. What, what is in a number? Why does it matter whether God is one or whether God is two or whether God is three or whether God is all the numbers? Is God infinite? Why does it matter? Discussion question. Secondly, is it, is it a good idea to draw God or not? Is it a good idea to have a picture of God looking a particular way or not? What do you think? There are many religious debates about this and some religions say, no, don't do it. It's too dangerous. You might veer into idolatry. Other religions say, yes, yes, it's good to be able to relate to God with an Im through an image. What do you think? Um, so I'll leave it with those two discussion questions, and I hope we can have a good conversation. Please bring your questions uh, to the moderator, and I look forward to talking about all of this with you. Thank you. Rebecca, for your talk on the harmonic one, um, like to welcome you to the question and answer part of our, our time together and would also like to ask if there's any practical takeaways that you'd like to offer your listeners. Sure, thanks. Yeah, I know I get a little technical there at the end and in the middle. Um, so I appreciate that question. Um, the takeaway, I hope, is that our idea that we hold so dear in our tradition of the oneness of God, that it is a, a big oneness. It's not a small oneness. Um, and that we often use, or sometimes we use the idea of God's oneness to distinguish ourselves from other forms of Christianity or other religions. Um, that this is, this is our emphasis, that we are different because we have this, this way of understanding God. 
And I want to suggest that rather than being a way of distinguishing ourselves or separating ourselves off, that our idea of oneness uh, is one that connects us to other traditions and to other ways of understanding God, that um, our, I, our concept of oneness holds within it a plurality, holds within it room for difference, uh, room, room for understanding the, all of the ways that God shows up in different contexts. Um, so that's, to me, uh, a, a takeaway. Um, a question that came up was, um, is the plural form of the divine in Genesis indicative of it being part of the ancient word? Is Elohim mentioned in other parts of the Old Testament? Yeah, so the word Elohim shows up thousands of times in the Old Testament. It is one of the primary ways, words that God, is, that was that for God in the Bible. Um, it's everywhere. It usually comes with singular verb forms and singular pronouns. Only rarely does it come with plural verb and pronoun forms uh, like we find in Genesis. So there is a evidence, you could say, that this is an older form that is adopted into an, a monotheistic idea of God. But it, it, the word Elohim in the plural is found thousands of times in the Bible. And a, a further question on, on that issue is, if Elohim is the imminent divine, as SH9160 suggests, which name or names would be the transcendent divine? Yeah, so I, I sort of answered this after you asked that in the in the comments, um, but that Swedenborg maps kind of the two names for God, Elohim and the holy name, YHWH. Swedenborg maps these two names for God onto this kind of um, dual understanding of God as imminent and transcendent. So Elohim um, is the one and uh, the name YHWH is the other. Sometimes, uh, so Swedenborg and Swedenborgians will correlate the name with the divine love and Elohim with divine, divine wisdom. Um, if we have to invite the covenant with God, is it enough to want it or do we have to do something to understand it to make ourselves ready? Hmm. So Swedenborg and Swedenborgians are um, interested in a kind of internal perception of the divine that, uh, and I think this is where the metaphor of the instrument of the harmony, the, of the harmonic oneness of God um, helps us here that it's not, our relationship to God is not a purely intellectual one. It's not one where we can say, I believe this, therefore I'm in relationship with God. Rather, it is a it's more on a, the level of perception. It's on the level of affection. Um, there is an intellectual component to it, but you're using the language of covenant that our relationship to God is not just one of signing on the dotted line. Um, it's one of, of making ourselves in harmony with through an internal perception with the divine. But I, that's a great question. I would love to hear in the comments other people's uh, thoughts about that. And along that same line, um, do angels have to be invited in or are they always around us whether we think of them or not? Yeah, angels I think if there another takeaway from all of this is that angels are key to our relationship to God. Uh, we are. Somebody said in the comments that um, our ideas about God are so informed by where who we're around, and this in this level, on our earthly existence, our, our this our natural communities really shape how we think about God. And Swedenborg would say, yes, and our spiritual communities, we're in community with angels, and that affects the way that we receive um, influx from the divine, at it, and the, our community with angels affects our perception and our ideas about the divine as well. Um, a little tangent here, my brother, who's an art historian and teaches at Bernathan College, Bernath, uh, Bernathan College is doing a study of Swedenborgian altar spaces and how um, images of the divine are depicted on in churches and noticing that 
Typically, the divine is not pictured in human form on Swedenborgian altars. It's a very interesting phenomenon. And if you go back and watch the parade of churches from two nights ago at convention, you'll notice this, that there are very few uh, human depictions of the divine on Swedenborgian altars. And what, why is that? Instead, we often see angels, a plural, a plurality of angelic forms, or you'll see uh, the open word is traditionally a Swedenborgian um, altar form. Um, so what's, the, what's, what's going on there? Um, what does this imply? How does this affect our experience of worship? Uh, very interesting thing to take note of. Well, your talk has inspired a lot of questions in the comments and um, one which sort of goes along with what we were talking about just now is that one questioner remarks that your presentation struck me as God accommodates to us in all our states. How would you comment on that? Yeah, I think um, that's one of the messages here that God is not going to come down out of the clouds and show God's self and then we will suddenly understand what God looks like or the nature of God, that um, God appears to us where we are and shows up where we are and meets us in our own time and place and language. Um, and there isn't really another way for it to happen. This next question refers to our uh, an earlier lecture, but um, also is depend it's, um, inspired by the beginning of yours when you showed the, the video. Um, and the questioner asked, can you talk more about images of God and racism that was referred to in the video and how we might engage this work in our churches? Yeah. So the, the suggestion from that Stanford study in that video I showed was that um, if we grow up with an idea of God as a white man, that we then map that onto ideas about who makes a good leader and who makes a good boss, and that we should be aware of how we depict God uh, in imagery and artwork, because that effect that influences who we think makes a good leader. Um, so there are different solutions to that problem. And again, I'm interested in the comments and hearing your thoughts about that. Is it better to to not depict God at all? That's one answer. Um, and maybe that's what we do as Swedenborgians if we think about this phenomenon of, of our altar space. Um, or somebody would say, somebody else might say, no, it's better to depict God looking lots of different ways. It's better to have an image of God as a woman, an image of God as a person of color. And um, one nice example of this is all of the different nativity sets that we find now from all different places of the world where Jesus and Mary and Joseph look like uh, the people of different different contexts, different places around the world. And so that might be another solution to that problem. Uh, I don't think there's one right answer. Um, Here's a comment that's, uh, it's very much a, a wondering, but uh, it's just gonna read it out loud because I find it very ch challenging for myself. It says, maybe God is manying as a verb, participle and gerund. Multiplicity is what God does. And that's listed as a question. Mm -hmm. um, God as a verb has been something that I think we've not yet addressed. So we, we so often talk about God as an entity, but what, what are your thoughts on God as a verb? God as a verb, but I'm hearing something else in there too. God as a, a would you say a manying? Manying. Manying. Yeah, I think, I think that that's sort of what Swedenborg is suggesting. Again, it doesn't always get translated through that way. I think somewhat sometimes translators may be nervous with this idea in Swedenborg, but that there is a manyness to God and a oneness to God. Um, and that we sometimes gloss over the manyness. Um, that God is God is made up of infinite things. And um, I'm yes, I'm very interested in in pulling this out from our text and thinking about its implications. One implication to me is that there are ways of kind of opening God up and there are ways of closing God down. And if it helps you to open God up 
to depict God as a woman, then that's a that's a helpful depiction of God. If that shuts God down for you, if it if it if it um, limits God, if it stops your dynamic relationship with God, then that's not a helpful image. But what are the ways of depicting God and relating to God that open us open us up to a dynamic dynamic and moving relationship with the divine, not a static and still one? Well, I want to thank you for our, um, all this time to explore some of the comments and questions. I think perhaps your lecture raised more questions as it went along and um, people were definitely engaged. So thank you very much. And um, I want to thank our audience and to let you know to stay tuned for at five o'clock, we'll hear from Reverend Dr. Jim Lawrence on near death studies and Swedenborg's spiritual world. Thank you all for joining us today. And thank you again, Rebecca. Thank you.